Carcinoma is not really going down. You look at the trends, there's a mild decrease, and that's because it's probably too early uh, to tell the benefits of the vaccination program because, as you know, hepatoma takes many years to develop. So, uh, to my mind, hepatitis B is going to be a dying disease because of the vaccination program. Uh, we do get a few breakthroughs. I'm sure Richard will discuss vaccines and vaccine breakthroughs, and these are the patients we tend to see still. But uh, we tend to see less and less of patients, and most of the patients we see now are the older age group. Now, I just want to, to go through a few of the new concepts of hepatitis, so to set things right. Um, first of all, hepatitis B, we know, is a dynamic state. In other words, we do not say uh, hepatitis B is a patient with uh, cirrhosis or a healthy carrier and it's a healthy carrier for life. Things change a lot, and patients can change to a normal person to one with bad hepatitis and cirrhosis. One can be stable for many years and then can be unstable or get a severe condition in a few years. So, the important thing to stress is it's a dynamic state. Everyone has to be aware of it and to monitor the patients carefully. Um, the other thing is that we now use, uh, you find that a lot of us use the HVDNA readings as a guide to treatment and as a, and as a guide to uh, uh, diagnosis and assessing a patient. So this is something which I think uh, for your general practice it is good to start doing this test and to recognize that it's important for assessment. So we see a lot of patients who have, this, uh, who have tests done, but uh, very often the DNA is missed out, and the DNA is very essential now in assessing a patient's condition. And uh, the last thing which, which have time we talk about is the HIV genotypes, which come in recently. We know there are uh, six main genotypes of uh, hepatitis B, and each genotype has got different uh, prognosis and treatment. Now, the old concept of hepatitis B is that it's a, it is a fixed concept. That means everything is fixed and you don't change. But we now know that it's a chronic infection. Every time they find hepatitis B is a chronic infection with or without liver disease or with, adult, or with activity. And you know that the disease can fluctuate with time. Now, um, by definition, uh, if you have a normal hepatitis B carrier and you call the patient a true carrier, then the patient should be E-antigen negative, uh, E-antigen body positive, or normal liver function test, and a DNA level of less than 2,000. And the liver biopsy is done, there's minimal or no inflammation. So that's the strict criteria for a person who is the so-called hepatitis B carrier without liver disease. It's very important to have this criteria because, as I show in, in, the, in the next few slides, there are a lot of patients who have got normal liver function by high DNA and there are a lot of uh, grey zones. So a normal patient with hepatitis B carrier must have this strict, properly strict criteria. Anybody out of this might not be normal. Now, hepatitis DNA is very important in assessing liver disease and it's uh, more accurate than HHPT, especially in patients with advanced disease. Uh, so you have to use a combination of ALT, ALAST plus DNA, but the DNA is by far a more accurate test. And it's also a very important parameter in progression of liver disease. We know that high DNA levels are presently high, give rise to uh, more severe liver disease. And we have the different parameters for various stages of the disease beyond which they need treatment. Now, this is a very old study. The review study has come many, many years ago. Um, this is the first few slides when it first, when it first presented. This study is criticized because it's, uh, it's a, the, the DNA levels were shown to correlate with cirrhosis, hepatoma, and worse liver condition. But this study was criticized because the levels were done at initiation and they were not followed up. But anyway, this review study quite clearly shows that the DNA levels correlate with more severe liver disease. And um, patients with hepatocellular carcinoma and chronic liver disease, cirrhosis, tend to have high incidence of uh, this problem when the DNA is higher. Right? And the same thing with the mortality uh, with, with hepatomas. So this is a few slides to show you that DNA is very important 
and we will be using it. You find that in practice, we use it very, very frequently. Uh, for my own practice, I tend to use DNA for my normal carriers at least once a year. I do that just to assess. But if you've got a patient who has got problems, then most of us tend to do it more often. But I always believe that as a baseline, we should do at least once and probably follow up once a year with the DNA level. Now, like I say, we use the DNA now because uh, there are various uh, levels beyond which we consider treatment. If the patient is antigen positive persistently, then we tend to consider treatment if the DNA levels are more than 20,000 international units. If it's antigen negative, we tend to consider treatment if it's more than 2,000 units. If the cirrhosis is compensated, we tend to consider treatment if the DNA is more than 2,000. Of course, it's decompensated, we treat any level. Uh, these are just guidelines, but it just tells you that we use DNA as guidelines, but there are other factors we do, we do look at before we consider treatment. Now, coming to the spectrum of disease, hepatitis B, um, this is an old slide. You realize that um, uh, if, you are, if you have got a parental infection, about 90-95% of patients with entry will develop chronicity. Um, and with vaccination, the, the rate is cut down to about 10%. Now, if you develop uh, hepatitis B, at childhood, that means uh, uh, at uh, not perinatal, but in the first few years of life, then the chances of having chronic infection are much less. And you develop adulthood, the chance of having infection is actually less than 1%. It's not a fire, now it's less than 1%. So the most important thing when you see a patient with a history of hepatitis B is trying to get a history, a family history of hepatitis B, trying to find a source of it because the prognosis is so different. If you get hepatitis B when you're young uh, and you're at birth, then the prognosis is very different from one who gets it after birth, that means even at a young age. Because the prognosis is better if you get it at an older age group. It's always bad if you get it at birth. So we always try to get a history from the patient as to how they manage to get it. Is that family hepatitis B? Is there any risk factors somewhere else? And this also got to do things with the cause of the disease. The cause of the disease is much worse if you're at birth and the treatment is different. Now, this uh, for most of the other lectures, the rest of the lecture, we'll be discussing patients who have got a perinatal infection, these patients at birth, because it's the most common cause of hepatitis B in Singapore. Uh, classically, the, it's divided into three stages. So now we have almost five stages. The, old, the first few slides by this person, Chu et al., uh, he, he followed a patient, a group of patients with hepatitis B, and they followed them all the way, and they found that they actually had three main, uh, three main phases. The first phase was from about 0 to 15 years of age. It's the phase whereby the patient has got immune tolerance to hepatitis B. That means these patients have got high DNA levels, uh, normal liver function tests, and uh, actually a normal liver. These patients have got no, re uh, no immune uh, reaction to hepatitis B. And these patients generally uh, have got no problems. And they should not be treated. Then the second phase, the immune clearance phase, whereby the patients actually the body recognizes hepatitis B as a foreign and tends to act against hepatitis B. And this is the time when the patient body actually clears hepatitis B. And it's a phase whereby patients tend to be E antigen positive or E antibody positive and the DNA levels are lower. And the last phase, which is above the age of 35, is whereby the DNA levels are low and the patient has a quiescent or almost normal liver disease. So this is the classic uh, picture which was well, which been described many years, but now we know that things have a bit changed in the sense there are other phases which tend to be, uh, for example, there's a phase after a residual phase, which tends to have a flare of hepatitis. And I'll also be discussing uh, more in these phases as to what is abnormal in these phases and what to look out for in these phases. For example, you see a patient who's 35 years old or 30 years old and the liver function is, is normal and abnormal, what to do with the patient. Now, this is uh, the similar slide which shows you uh, in a nicer form what exactly happens to the patients in the classical phases. For the patient, the, the first initial phase is when the DNA is high, then the second milestone is when the DNA turns to, to anti-HBE, the third milestone is when the DNA is quiescent, right? And the fourth milestone is the clearance hepatitis B, which I will discuss later. But now we know that, um, although it's not written in the guidelines, there are other phases and I thought we'd include them because uh, everybody describes them now. And there's a phase after the quiescent phase whereby there's a reactivation of the DNA. And this classically is the E antigen negative hepatitis, which I'll discuss further. Uh, 